Thank you very much uh, to the European in University Institute and to Professor Glachon for having me here today. You don't get an opportunity every day to play on such a wonderful stage. So thank you very much. It's a great honor for me. Uh, when, you are, have, when you have to speak uh, about what Jean-Michel called the three pillars at the end of a long day, uh, of course, you will have to come back to a lot of what has been said already earlier today. And I will try to, do, to bring a lot of what has been said together. And the title of my speech is Targets Without Governance? Question mark. The Pursuit of the Strategic Energy Objectives of the European Union. The idea of an energy policy for Europe based on sustainability, security of supply, and competitiveness was developed by the European Commission in its first strategic energy review of January 2007. Already two months later, in March already 2007, these three strategic energy objectives were expressly accepted and approved by the European Council in record time. Mr. Mandil rightly said this morning that achieving the internal energy market is not an objective per se. And he is right, of course. And it's perhaps worth recalling that neither the Commission's first review nor the following conclusions of the European Council uh, defined uh, the internal energy market as a strategic objective, but rather as the cornerstone or the most important means to achieve the three other energy challenges. Article 194 of the Lisbon Treaty later on then uh, has taken up the environmental objective and the establishment of the internal energy market as a framework for more specific energy targets, such as the functioning of energy markets in general, energy efficiency, network interconnection, and security of supply. The first strategic energy review of 2007 acknowledged already from the beginning that there are trade-offs uh, to be recognized between those three objectives. I repeat security of supply, sustainability, and competitiveness. You cannot achieve all of them at the same level of perfection, or at least not at the same time. The driving force has been, from the beginning, very much the urgent challenge to fight climate change. The discussion about the trade-offs between the two objectives, sustainability and competitiveness, is, given the prerogative of climate policy, essentially twofold. Firstly, about the appropriate energy mix, and secondly, about the most efficient way and timing to achieve it. Article 194 of the Lisbon Treaty preserves the right to choose its energy mix for a member state. Over many years, or recent years, the energy mix prerogative of the member state has had essentially one purpose, to preserve the right of a member state to opt for electricity production from nuclear. The dispute about nuclear energy production will and cannot, of course, be solved in our discussion here today. I will also not judge whether and under what circumstances electricity could come cheaper from nuclear than from other sources. Depending on their standpoint, observers criticize, for example, the cost figures in electricity production from new nuclear power plants used in the primes models of the Commission's roadmap 2050 as too high or too low. On the other hand, the costs of new nuclear power plants, as the Finnish example shows, are not totally predictable, and there are still questions of safety and waste disposal which preoccupy many people and governments. In so far, it is very appropriate for the Commission to concentrate its efforts in the nuclear area on these issues of safety, even though it is in any case not for the, uh, rather for the EU, and not for the EU, but for a member state to decide if it wants to rely on nuclear or not. What is more interesting today is that all member states will increasingly rely on renewable energy sources by 2020 and beyond, be it directly or through trade with other member states. Member states have spent large amounts of money to finance in particular the startup of solar and wind electricity production. However, the development of large-scale production sites for wind in the north, offshore, and for solar in the south, together with the transport of electricity from the borders to the consumption centers of the EU, will be very costly. The Institute for Energy Economics, EWI, at Cologne University, in its study on cost-efficient RES-E penetration and the role of grid extensions from October 2011, for example, 
estimates that average electricity production costs could rise this decade in Germany by about 40%. Also, the PRIMES models foresee considerable increases of electricity prices over the next 10 to 20 years. EWI shows, however, that EU coordination of RES production and transport would lead to a more cost-efficient solution compared to the individualistic approaches pursued by member states today. Provided there is sufficient EU coordination for the development of the sites and the interconnectors, the necessary grid investments and an assumed reduction of costs of the new technologies, the average production costs, and that is the good news from EWI, could remain more or less stable over the following years until 2050, and this despite higher rest targets. Also in the prime scenarios, prices will flatten out after the initial increase. To reduce the trade-offs between sustainability and competitive need, competitiveness means, apart from the necessary improvements in energy efficiency, which is rightly a priority for the Commission, to reduce the costs of renewables penetration in the electricity sector as much as possible. The most difficult time for the adaptation will probably be the next 10 years or so. The trade-off with competitiveness is to a large degree intertemporal. So to speak, a bet on a stronger competitive position in the future once the energy transition will have been successfully accomplished. Stronger EU coordination with the functioning internal market appears to be an essential element for a cost-efficient adaptation, and action would be useful in particular in the following areas. Firstly, the Commission should propose a framework for a coordinated development of renewable energy in the EU. One element of this plan should be to use the development of smart grids for the reduction of consumption, peak shaving, and for further stimulation and integration of locally produced electricity. This will by far not be enough to cover all our needs, but the less electricity is consumed at the peaks and the more electricity is produced decentralized, the less needs to be transported from larger sites over long distances. Peak shaving and decentralized power production merit to be better recognized in EU policy. With regard to larger scale production, part of a new renewables plan is already covered by the infrastructure package now under discussion, in particular the streamlining of the permission process, the investment planning based on the 10-year network development plan by NCOE and the related financing. This needs to be complemented by an understanding at the EU level and between member states on a renewables target beyond 2020, on the siting of production and on the means to stimulate the necessary production. It would be helpful to have at least a basic understanding on the financial incentives um, needed for renewables in line with the state aid rules of the Commission, even though I realize that the existing distortions between member states cannot only be explained by differences in the financial support schemes for renewables. Otherwise, Greece, with support for PV twice as high as Germany and much more favorable weather conditions, would come out much better. I would hope that the Commission will propose a new comprehensive renewables plan as quickly as possible. This is a great political challenge. Secondly, finalize the internal energy market in electricity and also gas, of course, in order to allow as much as possible such an optimal allocation of resources within the EU. The process of developing grid codes that was started some 18 months ago is progressing quite well and one should reasonably expect that the major codes, for example, those related to capacity allocation, congestion management, balancing tarification and so on, will be in place by 2014 as planned. Moreover, it is very positive to see that the development of the internal energy market is not only coming top down from Brussels, but that market coupling by the TSOs is now spreading from the northwest to other regions, and that the cooperation of the power exchanges is getting wider across Europe. The improvements of the internal market will be an important and necessary prerequisite for a cost efficient deployment of renewables. After sustainability in relation to competitiveness, I would like now to briefly look at the role of EU policy and security of supply in relation to the two other objectives. There is a priori not much of a contradiction between energy security and sustainability policies. Both rely heavily on diversification. 
Improved energy security comes, however, at a certain cost. As had been mentioned this morning, there will be probably an interesting discussion coming up about the respective roles of renewables and natural gas with CCS in the energy mix beyond 2020. In the past years, EU security of supply has been mainly a question of natural gas. Following the two crises of Russian gas supplies through the Ukraine in 2007 and 2009, the EU has adopted a new regulation to be better prepared for such eventualities. Member states are now obliged to undertake a risk analysis and to make their infrastructures more redundant to counter major disruptions. Regional cooperation, sufficient storage and reverse flow capacities play an important role. The cost of these measures appear to be well justified to safeguard household and industrial consumers over time. The integration of the internal gas market in, of the EU is the best weapon for energy security. Even so, some observers, at least I had the impression this morning, already see a gas glut at the horizon. I would still be somewhat prudent. Indigenous sources of natural gas will be declining drastically over the years to come. I should also say that the gas consumption of the EU, um, depending on what uh, scenario will probably not be reduced very much, but will remain more or less stable. That means we need additional sources to, uh, to complement the, the reduce of the domestic production. For the time being, it looks as if shale gas will probably only be a partial remedy for certain regions and play just a marginal role at EU level overall. Therefore, it is important to continue efforts to develop new gas supply sources such as LNG and the Southern Gas Corridor. The latter would open the huge resources of the Caspian region for Europe and provide a useful complement to the gas supply from Russia, in particular for the eastern and southeastern parts of the EU. There will be enough gas available in the Caspian region to fill a large strategic pipeline and I think there are good chances for an all-encompassing approach between the now still competing pipeline projects. The next month will provide some clarification. To diversify EU supply is not anti-Russian. Both sides are interdependent and have an interest in good energy relations. Russia also still has some difficulties to come to grips with the new internal energy market. Some critics say that for the sake of energy security, the EU should not put so much emphasis on applying the internal market rules and the relations to Russia. I would disagree. The third package provides for appropriate exemptions, for example, also for South Stream, should it ever happen. But the EU should and could not establish a separate legal regime for companies in Russian ownership active within the EU. This is true also for electricity, where the wish of the Baltic states to integrate the electricity systems in the EU market will provide for interesting discussions with Russia. Of all the detailed actions in, the, in external energy policy outlined in the Commission's communication at the end of last year, the development of a coherent policy towards Russia is the most important. The other is the EU policy in favor of the Southern Gas Corridor. Let me add in brackets that the latter includes, of course, also the relations to Turkey. Both Turkey and the EU have an interest in good energy relations which should not be taken hostage by stalled negotiations on Turkey's adhesion to the EU. At least in these two areas, Russia and the Southern Corridor, external energy policy cannot longer be usefully pursued just on the national level. As in the aviation sector some 20 years ago, the development of the internal competence is leading to more external energy competence of the EU. With regard to, security, to energy security, electricity may, however, challenge the political preeminence of gas in the coming years. UK, France, and some others are considering capacity mechanisms to ensure electricity generation adequacy. The consultancy Consentec has just evaluated this February the efficient management of possible capacity mechanisms in Germany. Consentec finds that for Germany, capacity mechanisms are only necessary if the objective is to achieve national autarky. If this is the aim, Germany could indeed experience a capacity shortage over the next 10 years of some 4 to 8 gigawatt. 
Sentik concludes, and I translate from the German original, if one decides to pass from a national viewpoint on supply security to a European perspective, capacity mechanisms are not needed, at least not in the longer term. This would mean to give up the pursuit of national autarky of, for electricity supply and to safeguard instead security of electricity supply in a region encompassing several states within the European connected system, jointly using existing resources. And later on, this paradigm shift of energy policy requires, however, a process of European coordination of national policies combined with the institutionalization of responsibilities at the European level. The message from the Consentex study is clear. Cost-efficient planning for electricity production capacity is better done at EU level. However, I have no illusions. In the short run, the natural reflex of many member states will be to safeguard the autarky of their production park. Capacity mechanisms may, however, jeopardize the internal electricity market. If they are considered unavoidable, they should be construed in a way to distort the internal market as little as possible. Consentech has also shown how this is done. It is cheaper and less market distortive to build up a strategic reserve than to tender new market capacity in general. Such a strategic reserve would enter into operation in time of shortage only and therefore not affect market operations as new subsidized capacity would. The Commission should therefore analyze the plans of the member states very carefully. There may be good reasons to consider the planned capacity mechanisms as public service obligations. As such, they should be checked and approved, possibly with conditions, by the Commission before they are put in place. The Commission should verify that they are proportionate, possibly time-limited, and distort the internal market as little as possible. They should in particular not affect the dispatch of power in the day-to-day -day operations. It would be advisable for the Commission to strike preemptively and issue guidelines as soon as possible before the Member States create distortive effects on their own. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming slowly to the end and I have to confess that apart from the question mark, I have taken the title of my presentation, Targets Without Governance, from an article in the European Energy Review rather critical about the Commission's Roadmap 2050. And I've added a question mark because I wanted to come to a positive conclusion. I'm much more optimistic about the developing EU governance. Even though the development of the internal energy market started already 22 years ago, as has been said this morning, speed over the last five years has been quite remarkable. Critics tend to forget how much has been achieved in EU energy policy since the first strategic energy review. In fact, the five years since January 2007 were probably the most dynamic for EU energy policy since the creation of the European Community for Coal and Steel in the 1950s. It is perhaps because of the expectations created by the increased dynamics of the recent past that we today realize so clearly that more still needs to be done. Indeed, if the European Union wants to pursue its strategic energy objectives further, it must increase its efforts, but progress and success are possible. To sum it all up, I think the European Union must further develop its energy policy in particular in the following areas, as outlined earlier. First, strengthen energy efficiency measures and develop a comprehensive renewables plan for the time beyond 2020. Second, finalize the internal energy market 20, by 2014, in particular through grid codes, market coupling, and EU guidance for possible electricity capacity mechanisms. Third, adopt an infrastructure package as proposed by the Commission to stimulate and support the necessary investment. And fourth, pursue an active external energy security policy at the EU level, in particular in relation to Russia and for the development of the southern gas corridor, including Turkey. And as a reminder, I would also flag that in two or three years' time, we should verify whether ACE needs more regulatory powers to better coordinate the national regulators. Despite all trade-offs, the strategic energy objectives of the EU can be achieved in a satisfactory manner, but they require an appropriate governance at EU level. Only together, the EU member states can succeed a policy of sustainability. Together, they are stronger in energy security and more competitive too. National measures 
are no cost-efficient substitute for a sustainable and secure EU energy policy. Thank you very much.